Um, so, so welcome everybody to um, Hybrid Audits, um, which is the um, the webinar for today. Uh, Matthew Bug, who's the quality manager for Australia and New Zealand for Beijing, um, is going to run through Hybrid Audits, do a do a presentation. Uh, please collate your questions as we go through. Um, and do use the Q&A function, and I'll show you how that, how that works now. So just in, just in Zoom, if you um, can use the Q&A function if you're going to ask any questions. So there is a chat function as well. If you've got any technical questions or anything like that, I'll be looking at that as well. But put all your questions in the Q&A, and Matthew and I will, will answer those, and I'll... I'll I'll do those as we go through. So I, I can help you. I can read those out, Matthew, um, afterwards. So you can do the Q&A. Or if you're comfortable, I can interrupt you if there's one that's pertinent to a slide, if you don't mind, or I'll leave them all to the end. It's completely up to you. Um, and what I'll do then is that's it for me as, a, as an intro. So I'll hand over to you, Matthew, if you want to share your screen again um, and talk us through hybrid audits. That'd be wonderful. OK, thank you. Thanks, Scott. Um... Okay, let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, are you receiving that now, Scott? Yeah, that? that's perfect, yep. Yep. Yep, Fantastic. Okay, so thanks for having me here, Scott. Um, it's been a little while since my my last talk for Racy. I, I really enjoy um, the racy webinars and and um, the, the hot topics discussions that we have. So, you know, hopefully we'll we'll um, have some fun today on the on the topic of hybrid audits. And thanks to everyone for for joining me today on this session. Um, I think we've got lots of really useful content. If you are in the process of preparing for an audit, or maybe you've got one on the horizon, hopefully we can provide some information today that will be useful for you. And uh, Scott, yes, I am happy to take questions as we go through the presentation as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, so three um, areas which I want to focus on is the preparation for hybrid audits, um, a little bit on how to manage the audit and also just some hot tips for uh, when you get to that closeout stage of the audit, how, how to manage that part of the process. Um, but before we get into that, I just wanted to give a little bit more of a background on to the terminology of hybrid audits because there you may have two you, you may have some different understandings of what a hybrid audit is. Um, so your understanding might be that it's a combination of um, being on site and also having a, a remote element to that audit. And you would be right in having your, your understanding there that that is also a hybrid audit. Um, but I also want to cover some of the um, pilot hybrid audits, which uh, an organization called ICMA, I ICMA has been uh, hosting um, over the, the, the COVID pandemic period. So I just wanted to talk a bit more about ICMA and who they are and what, what these pilot hybrid audits actually consist of. Because in this case, we're talking about hybrid aud audits across different regulators um, manufacturing one particular site. So just just some background on on ICMA. They're, so they are uh, they're an informal group of leaders of medicines regulatory authorities, and they provide strategic directions for enhanced calibration and improved communication and approaches uh, across regulators to jointly address uh, common global challenges. So in this case, we we're mainly talking about when we went into the the pandemic era with with, with the COVID pandemic. And really their, their mission is to, to safeguard public health. And they do this by facilitating strategic leadership and greater cooperation between international medicines authorities on shared regulatory issues. Now the, the aim of ICRA is to, is to strengthen the quality and the safety and efficacy of medicinal products globally. And uh, there's a few different areas which they work on, um, which you can see on, on the slide here. Um, so we've got uh, a few projects here, which, which is antimicrobial resistance, 
um, has been an issue for a few years, particularly with the overprescribing of, of antibiotics, uh, communications on drug shortages and other strategic pathways such as pharmaceutical innovation, pharmacovigilance, and that regulatory convergence and bringing the regulators together so we get alignment on how we, we tackle the bigger, the bigger issues like the COVID pandemic and how we respond to maintaining our um, pharmaceutical supply chain. Now you see here, I've got a big sea of flags. Um, these are all the members of ICMRA. You see that we've we've got all the all the major healthcare regulators. We've got the TGA, MedSafe, UK MHRA, European Medicines Agency, US FDA. So all the major, a lot of the major um, healthcare regulators are part of of this group. Now, just to give some background on how this would work um, and in this definition of a hybrid inspection this is where we've got joint regulatory agencies that are teaming up together to to inspect a site and just to give some more you know you just expand a bit more on on the background and how this came around where you know as, as we you know we've all been through it with since the start of 2020 in march with the the covid 19 pandemic which really forced a lot of the regulatory authorities to to pause inspections and then the remote inspection process was introduced uh, roughly around i think it was from march 2020 for domestic inspections and then from august 2020 for overseas inspections by the tga now in july 2021 the ICMA workshop, uh, which was enabled to discuss manufacturing capacity in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in this forum, there was recognition that there needs to, um, there needs to be a, a process to assess the feasibility of having collaborative uh, hybrid inspections. Um, now, the scope of the pilot hybrid inspections is initially was initially limited to uh, pre-approval and pre-licensed drug inspections and participating regulatory authorities uh, included the EMA, the European Medicines Agency, uh, Health Canada, uh, US FDA, uh, UK, UK MHRA, uh, the Anvisa from Brazil and the PMDA, which is the Japan Pharmaceuticals Medical medicines medical devices agency now each pilot involves at least two regions and the lead of that inspection would be responsible for the inspection process in its entirety um, and it it's there to conduct free assessments or collaborative hybrid inspections and the pilots are normally expected to last for for one year now the launch of these pilots were building on the discussions that were held from the July 2021 ICMA workshop, which did include over 400 delegates from over 30 uh, medicines regulatory authorities globally, as well as experts from the pharmaceutical industry. Now, benefits to the inspection. Um, now, some of you might look at that photo where you've got two healthcare regulators knocking on your door. Here, I've used the example of USFDA and, and, and the uh, MHRA. I'm not sure how I would feel if I had both those regulators at the same time. But the benefits to this is that it allows multiple regulators to inspect a site and help to accelerate the availability of critical medicines. And hopefully it should save time at the facility where you don't have to go through duplicate inspections. Now, in terms of the applications that can be used for hybrid inspections, and, and this is this is where we've we've got a, a series of being on site and uh, auditing remotely. Uh, I've listed three scenarios here. Um, so scenario one is where we're looking at certain aspects of the pharmaceutical system, and then at a later date, um, we can we, we'll, we'll do a remote inspection. There could be a scenario two where you've got that follow-up. So there's a follow-up site verification process, which um, maybe couldn't be performed due to time constraints as part of the remote inspection process. And then you've got scenario three, which is probably the most likely situation that we will find or we will come up against in, in Australia, um, which is the assessment of quality management systems. And then at some point, because we haven't been able to attend site or the regulator hasn't been able to attend site, 
um, there'll be a remote inspection at, at a, a, an on-site inspection at a later date. And during this process, with the use of hybrid inspections, um, regulators have been able to apply the remote oversight to sharing of documents, uh, facility tours, um, review of data and access to relevant electronic systems and uh, also interviewing uh, SMEs. And I'm now going to just discuss a few steps with you on how to prepare for remote audits. Okay, now this information has been referenced directly from the TJ website and it is still current. Uh, I did check this uh, on Tuesday, uh, so it's re these points are referenced from the the, the TGA website on guidance on, on how to prepare for if you've got a remote element to your inspection, you see that there's six key points here. Um, the top three are the ones that I'm going to talk about in more depth. Um, this is how to prepare um, for remote inspections and having pre-recorded videos and how, how to organize site tours. Um, just making sure that you've got uh, a platform where you can share information and how you test that technology and also access to quality management systems. Um, but there's also some other challenges to be aware of to, to manage the, the inspection, particularly if, if you're having an overseas inspector or or maybe it's a, a corporate order or, or maybe a, a, um, a, a sponsored supplier qualification order where the, the auditor might not be in the same country or there might be a team of auditors across different countries. So there's just some considerations to make for, for different time zones and how you're responding to documentation requests and trying to make sure that that is done in a timely manner. Um, also, if documents are in a different language, the expectation is to, to have them translated and also have an interpreter available as part of that inspection process. Now, just to go into direct access to electronic QMS systems. Now, um, feedback from ICMA, and, and just before we go into that feedback, that just to point out that this is this is now an expectation for regulators to have direct access to your electronic quality management system. So if you're using, let's say, Viva or Trackwise, that's your um, platform for your electronic quality management systems. The expectation is that the, the regulator does have access to, to, to those systems. Uh, so uh, maybe you haven't experienced that yet. Um, but that is coming. So feedback from ICMA is that uh, from the pilots, from the pilot inspections, that there is there is um, concern from from the audity if you if you are allowing full access to regulators, to, so they have full access to to your uh, QMS systems. Um, I can't think why there would be why there would be so much concern. I mean, obviously, there's going to be concern about that, right? So that that's why we've got to work together. And there's some approaches which I've put on here. Um, so if you are being asked for direct access to your QMS systems um, and you don't have an option where you can set up a portal or a hub within your electronic system where uh, documents can be um, uploaded or, or, or there's a read only access element to it, um, you know, may, these are some things that you, you can put forward and, and discuss with your inspector and and um, just to make sure that they ha they do have access to that particular system. So have the discussion whether you can set up a direct re read only access if you feel uh, uncomfortable giving full full access to that system. And or the other option that you can ask is um, during the uh, inspection, um, whether a member of staff can be the navigator um for for the for the remote part and the inspector can dial into that channel and the staff member can just navigate wherever the inspector wants to go but it's just important to highlight that direct access and i've highlighted this in red to documentation by inspectors is certainly an expectation um, particularly with european regulators they are actually demanding full full access to your qms systems um, so if you if you do have a QMS system that's paper based, again, just have that discussion with your inspector on what's the most appropriate platform to share information with. And then other IT considerations 
to have in preparation for remote inspection is to make sure that you've got representatives from your IT team uh, that's available to help support and they are available to help support you throughout the inspection process. Um, also that you've had a trial run with your inspector and if there's a team inspectors have that trial run with all of the team inspectors. Uh, don't make the assumption that because the technology works on one inspector's laptop that it's going to work on all of them. Um, so we, we've had experience of this before. Um, so make sure that you test technology with, with all of the inspectors, um, that the platform you're using has got sufficient bandwidth and signal strength to share information across different parties, particularly where you're sharing large documents or if you are streaming videos for site tours or if you have prepared videos to share. Um, Google Chrome tends to work a little bit better than I've just put question mark dot dot dot. I don't want to say the name because I don't want to name another company and then they, they might sue me for saying that their technology doesn't work as good as go Google Chrome. but hopefully Bill's not watching. Um, and it's also really important to share, um, to check to check this technology, particularly with, with sharing large data files. So if you've got huge validation documents, um, how easy are they to download and how quickly can they be available for, for, um, for sharing with, with the inspectors and then setting up the correct user permissions. So, um, there's a lot of platforms out there that which are, are quite useful where you can set read only access you can set how long the documents available for um, whether someone can print a document or not tracking of documentation um, so there's a lot of tools that you can use that are quite useful for that process and then just moving on to tips for creating videos for remote inspections um, so just a point on this um, in terms of approach, if there is, if you are going through an inspection where it's got a remote element to it, um, the approach should always try to do a live stream um, because as auditors, as, as healthcare regulators, we want to see your process working. So if it's a manufacturing site, ideal, the ideal state is that we are there when it's a product run, or maybe if you're working in a QC lab, there's testing that's happening at the time. We, we want to see that. Um, and that's the whole purpose of the audit. So the the ideal state would be that you, you have technology where you can where you can do live streaming. But if you are in a site where maybe your test facility or your manufacturing line is um, in a location where you just can't get that signal, um, then sometimes you have to resort to videos. So here are some just basic principles on on how to how to make these videos. So first of all, obviously, and, and this would some of these will apply for a live stream as well. Um, check that general housekeeping is clean and tidy. I, you know, I guess it goes without saying, but um, you know, particularly if you're going into change rooms or, um, uh, you know manufacturing locations, packaging lines, that you, uh, things are tidy, there's contemporaneous workflow, things aren't left on the floor. Just make sure in general the area is, is nice and tidy. Um, all staff are following uh, gowning procedures. Um, so, you know, like the sleeves are tucked in and and um, particularly with aseptic locations that, you know, hoods are, are, are tucked in. Um, gloves are worn appropriately, uh, cover shoes are worn appropriately. Um, so these are all kind of typical things that you do get caught out on if uh, you're not paying attention to them in the videos. Um, control numbers, you know, so where you've got locations where if there's only supposed to be three people in that room, make sure that there's only three people in that room. Um, checking that signs, signage is current. Um, these can be typical deficiencies with, with videos that um, the signage of the location is, isn't current or like sign, where you are using GMP signs that they're not signed and dated so we can see that they're, they're up to date. And this is particularly important where obviously you've got materials with quarantine and release that, that everything's appropriately marked up and segregated. Um, also, if you are using facilities that are dependent on, on HVAC and air handling units, um, that you're making sure that air grids are not blocked. 
um, this 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 can be something that's typically overlooked where um, just for ease sometimes tables get moved around sometimes uh, equipment gets moved around and then you know, and then and then we we kind of normalize the fact that uh, there's actually a an air vent or a grid that's 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 blocking airflow so so these are all things to to check but also um, before you share any videos just make sure that that's been reviewed by your management team um, you know test sharing of videos on your laptop first um, check check that the sound is coming through um, you know depending on the application system you use for storage of the videos for example if you're using a sharepoint or an ms team um, you know the, the following points will, will will help facilitate effective sharing and that's um, ideally the the audit facilitator that the host will will download the video to their laptop and then and then share this with the the inspector um, you know sometimes it helps just to play the first 10 seconds and then put it back to the beginning so you can keep up with download speeds and then just make sure that everyone else that's attending the call um, they are turning off their cameras whilst you're um, sharing videos and that's just to keep the bandwidth um, as flexible and and uh, keeping that speed running up to the required state that you need as much as possible. Um, whilst talking about background noise, if you do need to, to make videos, um, ideally you want to, as we said, ideally you want to provide a, a video where the process is working. Um, so some machines can make a lot of noise and then if someone's standing there explaining what's happening then you can't hear them so it's actually good if you've got the technology where you, you film the process and then uh, you can narrate over the video and 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 add that narration to to the video that works really really well um, and also from a narration point um, you know we, we've we've got some um, good practices where you, you label the video for the location and also the date when you've actually made that that uh, that particular film and then make sure that staff that are working in the area and this is more relevant for probably live streaming um, that they're aware that that particular time um, there is an audit process that's happening because the the microphones can be uh, particularly sensitive um, and they can pick up a lot of a lot of background noise and keep the video short. Keep the duration. You know, it's better to do lots of short videos than lengthy videos because of the um, the amount of storage space you need. If you if you're making a video that's longer than three minutes, and you're trying to share that or transfer that, um, then the data is actually quite big. So you want to keep the videos short. It's better to have three short videos than one long video. Now, just moving on a little bit to uh, audit management and here I've got a, a schematic on what this could look like uh, and this one is uh, focused on a large facility uh, so when I say a large facility uh, I've got a schematic also for a small facility so we'll come on we'll come on to that next if you are working in a large facility where you've got a huge resource available to you. So I'm talking about the, the facilities where there's, there's the 80 plus in your quality team and you've got you've got that resource to put a team together like this. This is just a suggestion of what um, uh, um, uh, a, a flow would look like in terms of trying to set you up for success. Um, so first of all, you wanna make sure that your camera is turned on to build up rapport with your inspector. Um, and then you'll see from this slide that we have a lot of different roles that are involved in the inspection process and uh, there's a lot of communication paths which you can use so that the, the, virtu the virtual component of the audit can run efficiently. Um, so if we're looking at the, the audit host role, um, so this position is normally assigned to, to the, the, the head of quality position, but doesn't necessarily need to be a head. This, this, this could be a, a quality manager, um, but that person needs to be obviously someone that um, is very specialized in GMP, that understands the regulations. They are knowledgeable with the systems and processes that you have in place, and that can also communicate constructively 
Um, so obviously there'll be a lot of conversations with auditors and inspectors where you're you're trying to explain a system. Sometimes things may not be very well understood or misunderstood. Um, so it's important that that person in that position can communicate effectively, collaboratively, and constructively. Um, then you've got your uh, scribe position. So the person that you have in the scribe is the person that's taking the notes down for the inspection. So that's quite an important role, uh, particularly if there are order observations and you need a reference point to come back to. So you, you've got a record of what has been said. Um, so you need someone, again, that's that's very knowledgeable in GXP, that understands your systems and processes on site, but has also been through, ideally has been through inspections before, um, because obviously the more exposure you get to inspectors, you start to know um, what their concerns will be, uh, their line of questioning, where they might be going to next. So if you've got someone in that position that can try and preempt where the inspectors are going to next, you know, they may start to talk about validation and then, okay, all right, so the line of questions here, we looks like we're going to be heading towards cleaning validation, for example. So then um, that scribe can pass information onto your control room and let you know where where things, where where the conversation is potentially going. So this is really important because virtual inspections need to be as efficient as possible because we only have a very small um, window in time to, to audit. Um, it, it's, it's not as effective as being on site. The, the, the preference is to, to still be on site. Um, so we need to learn as much as we can about your facility, your site, your laboratory. Um, so to do that, we need information coming through as efficiently as we can. So if you if you do have the resource to run an audit like this, where your scribe is interacting with the host and the inspector, and then they can communicate with a control room where a control room is 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 picking up the re documentation requests that are coming through, and then they can start to organise SMEs, and um, also the where there's potential observations you'll see that there's a there's a kappa team here um, now if you have got the resource to do this um, and you do and you are being made aware that there are potential observations from the inspection and it's something that you can correct at the time it's good to try and do that so if you have got a resource, maybe there's um, something in the procedure that is not in line with the process. Now, you're obviously not going to get a procedure approved and trained out within the time window of an inspection. But if you can put a procedure in draft and then make an update and show that to the inspector, these are things that can help between whether something might be a major classification observation or a minor or whether it actually ends up being an observation at all. But just some caution to that. Don't be, although it's good to try and resolve issues as quickly as possible and resolve concerns as quickly as possible, do take a risk based approach to that um, because there are some situations where it would not be appropriate to try and resolve something during an inspection because you might have some complexity to that concern which re require you to do some process mapping you need to do some a, you know a deep dive into the process um, you need to do a full root cause analysis um, so if you were trying to resolve something too quickly then obviously uh, um, and you put and you put uh, you know he, he's a he's a corrective state that we're going to do going forward in front of an inspector then they may be concerned that you're you know you haven't thought it through very well you know, so you've got to use a little bit of common sense here in alignment with, with a risk-based approach. Um, really be aware of what's appropriate to to try and resolve quickly and, and where you, you do need to do a bit more of a deep dive into the issue. Also, um, for the SME preparation, um, so subject matter experts that are coming in to, to talk about their systems. Um, you know, please try and get as many people involved with the inspection as possible um, because we we want to build skills in our team. We, we want to build knowledge in our team. And 
and they're not going to get that if they're not exposed to inspectors. Um, so surround yourself with people, you know, you don't have to sort of carry the, the, the inspection all on your own. Surround yourself with, with SMEs. There's benefits to that. You know, two heads are always better than one with, with trying to answer questions. Um, and, and if you, if you can get staff exposure to the, to the inspector, then, they've, then they start to build that knowledge on how to address issues, on how to answer questions. Um, so if you've got someone in the control room that's, so going back to the discussions where the inspector's going, okay, we're starting to talk about cleaning validation. You you can start to talk to your SME. Okay, well, you know, the inspector's go talking about cleaning validation. Here's the questions that they might start to ask, start to think about how you're going to answer those questions and then get them ready before they actually go into a, a virtual channel, before they start to speak to an inspector. You know, try and prepare people on what the conversation is, what's what's the tone of the, the conversation, what's the nature of the topic, what, what's the potential concern. So they so they're able to to go in there knowing how to answer questions. So that's how it would look for for a big facility. Um, not so quite not so great if you're if you're a small facility, um, if you don't have the resource to run an inspection like this and and you are you are more on your own. Um, you know, so so maybe very you know, smaller organisations, or you don't have a, a big quality team on site to to support you. Um, so this, you know, it's the same kind. Of, the, the principles are the same. I mean, obviously you're, you're carrying a lot more on your own, but in terms of virtual platforms, um, you know, try and have someone that, that that can make a note of the conversations and support you with sharing documentation. So you. This can be a typical scenario for, for a lot of uh, facilities out there, a lot of sites out there that maybe it's the, the quality manager on their own. I've, I've, I've been in that position as, as, as well. Um, and, it's, um, and, when, and when you are starting to go through that process and you're having to wear many different hats, it, it can be um, a bit of a stressful environment. So the more you prepare for your inspections at the start with having discussions with your inspector on what documents you're going to need up front, how to share information um, will help you it, it, throughout this process. Now, just some uh, logistical considerations. Um, as we've mentioned, there can be differences of time zones. Um, so, if you have got an inspector that's in a different time zone or an auditor that's in a different time zone, try and, I mean, try and negotiate something that will work well for both of you. So if it's a one day inspection, can you do two half days? Um, you know, try and work something like that. You know, as long as, as long as the important thing is to cover the, the items on the agenda. So it doesn't necessarily have to be all in one hit doesn't have to be in one day if you can discuss um, different time frames you know tr try and try and do that but also just going back to sharing of documentation and this is really important because um, like myself uh, as an auditor there's there's a few sites that I have been to where there can be pushback on sharing documents prior to uh, inspections or even post inspections. Um, now, just have a think about that. If if that is your position of your company, how useful it is throughout an audit process. You know, we um, we need to work more collaboratively with inspectors. And I I, I understand that there's some information that may be sensitive, um, particularly analytical method validations, for example, product formulation. But if we're talking about general QMS systems, you should ideally be willing to share that documentation. So I'm talking about procedures or your site master file where that describes information about your facility, that describes information about your site. It's the virtual process, the remote process makes it harder on auditors and inspectors. Um, Again, because we're not on site, the process can be a bit slower. Um, sharing of documents can be a bit slower. So, you know, try and help your auditor and your inspectors um, speed that process up by allowing 
access to documentation either after or, or either before the, the audit or, or after the audit. Um, now, I appreciate there can be concerns with that, but, you know, your typical QMS systems are, you know, and just, just to be direct on this feedback, that your typical QMS systems are not something that will make or break your company. Okay, so if I want to look at, let's just say if I wanted to create a new procedure tomorrow and I Google deviation or risk management or site master file, I'll have over 100 templates that will come up that will be freely available on Google. And most of the information is typically, I mean, there will be subtle differences, um, but hopefully we're all following the same guidelines in accordance with GMP. And, you know, what you'll find is that your procedures aren't going to really differ that much from site to site. So, you know, I, I, the message there is you know, try and work a bit more collaboratively, be more, I'm just asking, be more open to sharing documents where the information is not product formulation or or from a validation point, sensitive information. Okay, and then also just making sure that your SMEs are available during the inspection. So give notice um, when the, the inspection date is actually booked, when it's scheduled, um, that we do need SMEs, or if that person's not available, that there is a, a backup that's available that can talk on that particular subject, particularly if it's a very specialised subject, um, then there is a backup to, to whoever's not going to be there. Now, just some tips on handling the closeout of an inspection. So as we've, as we've mentioned, access to documentation, um, there may be requests to uh, have documents available after the inspection. Now, whilst I've specifically called out that documents should be shared with inspection with inspectors, and I do encourage collaborative working, there does need to be a discussion on when the audit has finished. OK, so, for example, um, if the inspector requests certain documents to be made available two weeks post an audit, and this is this request is due to maybe time constraints, maybe they didn't have time to look at that particular system. I think that's reasonable to let them have access to those documents. Okay, as I've said, it's it's tough on auditors right now, particularly with the remote process. Um, just trying to cover what we need to in an agenda. There, there are the, the time constraints with audit logistics and, and access to documents. It's not as efficient as being on site. So I think it's reasonable where if, if we need to learn a bit more about your site that, and we haven't had time to cover that particular system during the audit, that that document is made available, those documents are made available after the audit. But there needs to be that discussion and a collaborative discussion on when is the order actually finished? You know, so I, 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 you know, I think there's there's different views on this also from the regulators um, on on uh, whether the order can continue after. Um, and this is just my personal view, um, but but I but I do believe that the audit process is supposed to be. Um, a snapshot window of time where you, you look at the compliance of, of the site. Now, um, if you haven't had the opportunity to, to cover those systems and you need more time longer, then you know, I, I think we should be given that opportunity. But in terms of when, if we, if we start to see issues in documentation that's been allowed to be viewed after the inspection, do we still audit observations? So I think there, there needs to be that discussion. I mean, obviously, if something major or critical is, is found, then um, it's not really something that you, you can discuss. So I think it's it's something that we it's something that's there. I mean, that that needs to be addressed. But um, have that discussion with your inspector on setting boundaries with making documents available after after the audit. And then just a little bit on the compliance ratings. Um, so you've got your compliance ratings from A1 to A3. Um, your ideal state should try, try and target the, the A1. Um, so 
you've got the conditions there on what well not conditions sorry the the criteria um, for uh, for your for your compliance ratings and this this is from a TGA uh, perspective. Now just to note for the A1 rating, if your inspection is hybrid or if it's not an on-site inspection, whilst you may have a really good inspection and have very few deficiencies, um, but it doesn't having an A1 rating is not just based on deficiencies there's other factors to take into consideration so for example your your previous compliance history um, whether you've had any uh, critical deficiencies from other healthcare regulators um, whether you've had a product recall during that year um, whether there's patterns of deficiencies within a system which might be minor but um, indicates that you've got a systemic failure so it's so it's not just a simple case of having my like only a few minor um, deficiencies um, but let's just say if you you do meet that criteria you, you've had good compliance history you haven't had any product recalls you've had a really good inspection you may um, find that because the inspection has not been an on-site inspection you may still have the A1 rating, but your inspection frequency will not be reduced until there can be an on-site inspection component part completed. OK, so I just wanted to finish with um, discussing that and how how the remote part can have an impact on on not necessarily your your inspection rating, but the the frequency of ha um, of your your audit schedule. And I'm going to finish it there and uh, take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. It's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We do have a few questions that have come through. Um, you probably can open the Q&A panel at the bottom of the screen uh, if it's helpful, but I'll read them out anyway. So we'll just go in order of the questions. So just because, you know, it might make more sense if you read it sometimes. But anyway, the first question came in relatively early. So if the audit is is online, is it OK to give control to the auditor while you're looking at the system? Have you ever done that? OK, so with regards to that and um, that it, it's changing now. So as we've mentioned in the slide where auditors are actually request uh, inspectors are requesting access to your electronic systems. Um, so this is certainly more relevant for European regulators where they are requesting full access to your systems. OK, so that's that's an expectation that's coming out now. Um, we have discussed this with the TGA and, and the, this guidance may change, but um, discussions that we've had with TGA on access to electronic systems is that their current position is that they are OK with read only access set up. Um, but it is dependent on your inspector. So you do need to have that conversation with your inspector. OK, now my best way to answer that question is that my preference would be is to if you can try and stay in control of your systems and uh, not hand over that access to inspectors. If, if the inspector is happy for you to navigate for them on your behalf, it's always better to be in that position. But the way that the, the guidance is and the expectations that are coming through from the regulators now is that that might not actually be your decision anymore. So, so are you are you specifically talking about when you're in an online session with the auditor that you give them control in your like Zoom or your your um, share screen or are you talking more generally giving them access to that? To that system. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. I didn't clarify that yet. Thanks for that, Scott. Yeah. No, so, I just I, I, I wasn't sure myself. That was all. <laughs> yeah. So just to just to clarify that point, it's it's this is this is um, granting access to to electronic systems. Um, this isn't if you're if you're in that situation where you're in a remote inspection, and then your inspector then asks for access so that they can navigate round because there's there's a training component to that part right you yeah know, so any, anyone that has access to your quality systems they they need to be trained in in that in that process in terms of um what rights inspectors have they have a right to ask for access to your systems but there still needs to be if that's going to happen there needs to be um considerations for what's the minimum training requirements mm. 
how do you set up that access level? It, it shouldn't happen as part of an audit where you're halfway through or you're in process of an audit where the inspector then turns around and says, can I have access to that system? Yeah, look, I, I think if you were an in-person audit and you were, I don't know, you were showing them your limb system of your laboratory, you wouldn't expect them to come and just take over the mouse and start Absolutely. navigating yeah. around. So it's Absolutely. the same thing to yeah. me, but anyway, no, cool. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, hopefully um, I clarified that part. No, that's yeah. okay. that's wonderful, wonderful. Um, uh, so how open are inspectors to being recorded? So there's direct audio, um, you know, that you can use and, and maybe it helps the scribe later on. I, I, I don't know. Is that are they things that have been done, recordings and that thing? I mean, I, 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 I my understanding of this is it, it's not very open to, to being recorded. Um, I, I wouldn't suggest to uh, approach that with the inspectors, I, I think just keep everything on the written path. Um, and, it, and this is also for not, not just inspections, but also, and this is one of the reasons why um, when regulators are, are doing presentations, the, the video sessions aren't necessarily recorded because you, you don't want to be in a position where you're hanging on the inspectors every last word. You know, and, and that's the danger with recording the sessions, yep. um, you know, like what the inspector said is, is gospel and and, um, you know, you're going to have a lot of information come through from the inspection. So I've, for me, I still think the preferred approach is is using the scribe, writing things down. I, I know it's a lot more convenient if you can um, record, record what's being said, uh, but I, I wouldn't advise that. I, yeah. but I think I think it's something that if you've got a good relationship with your inspector, or if you feel comfortable asking your inspector that question, ask them. And, and it is dependent on how the inspector feels. I don't think we could put a blanket statement on that and say this would be OK everywhere. I, I think you need to have that conversation with your inspector. Again, it's one of those ones where I think that if it was in person, you wouldn't walk around with a video camera video <laughs> yeah. and potentially. But anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that's cool. Um, uh, then the the next question is about, um, so what are your thoughts about BOH inspectors requesting significant volumes of documentation into like a digital storage portal um, to review outside of the audit? Um, since audits have moved into that digital space, feels more common um, than it used to be infrequent requests. It seems to be like more is being asked for on a larger scope, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think you've got to, um, sorry, I, I probably use the same words over and over again, but you've, you've got to risk manage that. And you've got to think about your, for me, the inspection process is, you've got to build your rapport with your inspector. And this is similar to some of the comments that I had in the talk where if you're not sharing documents, um, or if you're not willing to share documents prior to the audit and only on the day, or if you're not willing to share documents after the audit, you've got to think about how helpful that is to an auditor or an inspector when, let's face it, the remote audit process, whilst the technology is getting better, it's still nowhere near as, as efficient as being on site. Yeah. So you just need to have a think about how helpful it is if you're, if you're not sharing documents my advice to that is that, and this is similar to what I've mentioned in the talk, where you don't have information, where there's sensitivity to it. So, you know, the product formulation, um, method validation, um, so something that's very specific to your site, then that's something that you, you need to have a discussion with your management team on how you make those documents available and how long before and after. Um, but general kind of QMS procedures, things that describe the process, your site master file, your validation master plan, these types of documents, which are really, really helpful to inspectors to learn about your site. My advice is, is to share that information with them and it will be a much more happier inspection experience for both parties because it means that the inspector hasn't got to have a rigid adherence to the audit agenda like you know we're doing this at 10 we're doing this at 11 because if if we're in a situation where documents are not being shared with us 
we have to be like that. We have to mm -hmm. be like, right, we're covering PQRs at 10, we're going on to deviations at 11, because we've got to push to get through your systems. We, we've got to push to look at your, if, if it's a lab, we've got to look at your, your testing, your, 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 your method validation. We, we, we need to look at, we need to look at everything that, um, all the, all the, the key components. And so if, if information is not being shared prior, um, you know, it can lead, it can set you up for an experience like that where, okay, let's keep the closing meeting, uh, the opening meeting short, you know, just a quick 10 minutes, let's get straight into it. It, it, it sets you up for, for an inspection like that. Um, so how comfortable, if you're, if, you, if you're not comfortable sharing documents, how comfortable are you potentially being in an inspection scenario where we've got to get through the agenda and it's quite militant? Yeah, look, and it, you said right at the beginning there that you you want to build that rapport. If you if you look like you're hi, well, hiding's a bit harsh, but if it looks like you don't want to provide information, it's not going to build the best rapport, is it, with the inspector? I wouldn't say so. So yeah, yeah, no, and, it, and, it, and it's just going back to you know just try and see it through the eyes of the inspector, where you, you know they. they they don't just have one inspection they they're going on to lots of different inspections so information's quite important information's quite important with helping us to write audit reports and understand how your site works now that's cool and look there was only one last actual comment was that potentially um access to systems is something that could be raised at the TGA forum so which which is which is like March next year, I think. So that might be something. I don't know if that's already going to be raised or maybe something that should be raised. So Yeah, I, I believe that will be that, yeah. that is something that's going to be coming up at the, the next GMP forum. Cool. And that's all the questions we've got, Matthew. Again, a big thank you um, for providing this for us. Um, the recording will be available to people generally at a later date. Um, and yeah, unless you've got any closing th remarks, Matthew, I'll let you get back to the rest of your day. Yeah, thanks for having me again. And thanks thanks for everyone that has joined the call today. And um, uh, you've got my contact details as well. So if you've got any questions, you can send them through to me as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks again. See you, thanks, everybody. Thanks, thanks very much. Bye -bye. See ya. Bye.